I'm Dr. Michael Masters, and you're listening to Alien Theorist Theorizing. Theorizing. Welcome to Alien Theorist Theorizing, Theorist in the Desert. Uh, in This is the third uh, interview in our Theorist in the Desert theories. Uh, I'm Braden. I'm Zell. I'm Dan. And I'm Andrew. And we have special guest, Dr. Mike Masters. Uh, yeah, we're here with Mike, and uh, he is a professor of biological anthropology, and he specializes in human evolutionary anatomy, archaeology, and biomedicine. And we're here to explore with him uh, some of the persistent long-term biological and cultural trends in our own evolution that could perhaps result in us being the ones who are piloting UFOs. Awesome. Th thanks for coming on the show, Mike. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be uh, great to be right here. Right on, yes. and uh, so let's get right into it. What obviously this is a a unique field you're in. So, what's the catalyst that got you started? Like, how did you go down this avenue of exploring ETs as us from the future? Yeah, it actually uh, started when I was pretty young. I was about eight years old, and overheard my dad telling a story about a UFO that he saw. Not too long before I was born. And um, yeah, it was kind of your standard UFO encounter. It was in uh, a nighttime thing. He was out on a call. He was a veterinarian, had somebody with him too in the truck and um, just saw this bright light over the horizon. This is in the middle of Amish country, so there's no lights anywhere. And uh, all of a sudden this light just shot toward him and hovered probably about 100 meters off the ground or so, and then shot back across the horizon and then straight up into the sky. Tremendous rate of speed. And uh, he got the book Communion by Whitley Strieber not long after that. And uh, I remember looking up and seeing that on the shelf and uh, just having this kind of mental image with an early hominin or a chimpanzee-like creature, a modern human, and then this quintessential alien with the big head, the big eyes, the small face, and... Uh, I just kind of started wondering if there could be a connection, some sort of phylogenetic relationship. So started uh, going down that rabbit hole. And um, after many years of, of college and research and writing, decided to uh, put it all into a book. So published the book a couple years ago. I think it was March 2019. And um, yeah, it's been a, a wild ride ever since In that then. book, for people who don't know, is Identified Flying Objects. Yeah, that's right. Identified flying objects. Um, this kind of takes a multidisciplinary approach, looks at uh, anthropology, obviously, astrobiology, physics, astronomy. And, and yeah, it looks at this question of whether or not these uh, UFOs and the aliens could just be us from the future coming back to study their own past. Pretty much the same way I would as an anthropologist if I had access to that technology. Oh, man. I love that theory. We've we've bre we've touched on it before, but we obviously don't know that much about it. So, for someone who's just getting into this, how do you how do you bre like broach the topic of like bringing this to someone? Like how how do you explain us us like ETs as us from the future? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of things that make sense in the context of this model, what I've sort of dubbed the extratempestrial model, um, but especially just looking at our anatomy and the changes that have taken place over the last six to eight million years. And most notably in uh, human evolution, our craniofacial anatomy has changed, especially throughout the last 800,000 years. And primarily we've seen this trade-off between our brains and our faces. So our brains have expanded, not just forward out over the eyes, but also mediolaterally. Uh, we've gotten a more globular neurocranium, as we say. And as that happened, our faces have shrunk back and the whole <laughs> mid and lower facial area have completely refigured. So, and, and these changes have taken place regardless of where we lived, what the social or economic or political system was. They're just these really enduring trends throughout human evolution. So if those continue, 
regardless of whether we live in space or on the moon or wherever, we're likely to still have that same uh, cranial facial configuration and the same trend occurring in the same ways as it has throughout this very long period of time. So really just connecting the past to the present and then projecting that into the future, we're very likely to look like these beings that are so commonly described with the the big heads, the big eyes, the small faces, the lighter skin. Um, and obviously there's a lot of variation. The Dr. Edgar Mitchell Free Foundation, their uh, study showed that, that most are described as human or humanoid. Uh, and then you have the grays, the tall grays, the short grays. And only about 5% are reptilian or insect. And we know those so are from if, the middle if, of the earth. So that's already accounted for. Of course, yeah. Those, those <laughs> yeah. come from from the center of the earth. And, and so they're pretty rare. Um, but the fact that they're so commonly described as being upright walking, which is the trait that defines us, bipedalism, uh, they have bilateral symmetry, five digits on each hand and foot, two arms, two legs. They're, they're human in every sense of the word. Many are described as human. Right about 45 to 50 percent based on their study of over 3,000 uh, contactees were described as human. So really in the context of our, our evolution and where we're likely going, I think there's a strong case to be made that if these beings are being reported and they have human characteristics, they're either from a different timeline, another dimension per, per se, or from our future in a block time context, block universe model. Right. So just like uh, extrapolating on how humans have evolved into sightings of these ETs being this, like if you were to take us in 10,000 years, that's probably something what we'll look like. Yeah. I mean, it, it's hard to put an exact number on it, but if we're talking about the ones that look altogether human um, and speak vocally to us. And there's a lot of cases like that, a uh, couple that I'm writing about in my new book. There's, uh, it, it could only be a couple hundred years, honestly. If we're talking about the ones that still look like us, but are speaking telepathically, I'm guessing that's probably something that happens right. a little bit later. If we're talking about the grays, talls and the tall and the short grays, yeah, then we're probably looking at tens of thousands of years. So it really just depends on what group uh, we're, we're, we're referencing. Well, and, you know, that would account for, there's a, you know, a, what pops into my head is there has been a couple of encounters where, you know, people describe of seeing like a very female, like, uh, humanoid, very human, like with like a blend, right. Where you, you always hear about that human hybrid, but yeah. maybe that's just not too far right. in the future of what we're looking like. That's the stepping stone from us to that, to then further on, uh, moving on absolutely yeah in the book i refer to that as temporal ancestry so we don't really use the term race anymore it doesn't have any biological validity um but we we can talk about geographical ancestral groups so people that are african-american obviously have ancestral roots in africa uh, east asians europeans native americans so yeah in the context of of what you're referring to with this temporal ancestry, it's the same thing as geographic ancestry, but if they're coming back from different points in our future, and most likely once we have this technology to travel backward in time, we're going to have that throughout our future. It's not something that'll just disappear, kind of like fire and agriculture. We just keep doing it and uh, improving upon it. So, yeah, I mean, you could be theoretically picked up by somebody 100 years in our future, later that night by one of these grays from 10,000 years in our future, and, and it's still the same phenomenon. It's still the same time travelers, just from different points in in our evolutionary future. Right. So, uh, so that make that would that would account for like the different different shapes and you know descriptions of the ETs that people experience either in abduction or sightings. Yeah, I think so, and 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 helps kind of explain why most of them are are more human too. Um, the the further out we have this aspect in archaeology where the further back in time you go, you have less material available, sort of a temporal sample bias, you could say. So when we have beans and maybe these reptilians and insects like beans are just so far from our future that we don't even recognize their humanness right. anymore. And we would expect that to be a lower percentage if they are that far away, just because we are a blip on their screen. We're one of you know, many, many different periods that they could explore. So we wouldn't expect to see them as much as we would ones that are somewhat closer to us in time, I guess. That's cool. I like that theory. Um, so as abductions go, 
the reason they're the reason people are being abducted and like abducted i guess would be in your in, in your theory scientific like it, trying to see how your ancestors what like what they ate how they lived kind of thing or how what what do you think about that well, I mean, I, I have to acknowledge my own biases in that respect because I'm an anthropologist. I'm a paleoanthropologist specifically, so my interest is in the human past. So yeah, this, I certainly would acknowledge that there's many, many different things they could potentially be doing and reasons for doing it, but it does seem to be very similar to what I would do if I had access to this technology. Like I've worked on digs in South Africa and France throughout the United States, and we're trying to piece together our past with uh, fossils with teeth, and there's just not much to go on. If we could actually pick them up, we could not only learn so much mm -hmm. more about them, uh, their their DNA, their living tissues, but also their culture, their language. So it would really allow us to have a, a much deeper insight into the human past. So it, it kind of seems that that's a big focus, and, and these abductions are rare. I mean, a lot of people see UFOs in the sky, but it seems like they're only really allowed to interject themselves in this overt way for a scientific investigation. It seems like they're always trying to kind of remain hidden, but they come down and, and physically pick us up, uh, probe us in every way, take semen, take eggs, take developing fetuses. So if all these things are happening the way people describe, those rare instances are potentially the only thing that they're allowed to do um, for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, it does seem to have some sort of scientific or uh, research so objective. I'm wondering, like, do you think maybe instead of obviously going after a cadaver, because that'd be much easier for them, they go, they're going after, like, they they have the ability to go after live people because their tools aren't as, you know, as evasive? Yeah, that's a good, good point. I mean, it does seem like living tissue is of utmost importance, and not just with us, like with the mutilations, and it's, it's not just cows. Um, seals, there's a big string of horses in France that were just subjected to this same sort of thing. So, yeah, for whatever reason, it seems like uh, living individuals, both human and non-human, are, are more of the focus. But, yeah, that's a good point. Like, why not just show up at a funeral <laughs> home and rip somebody out of a <laughs> casket and, you know, take them up? It'd be a lot less traumatic for them if they're already dead. It's a good point. Pretty pretty traumatic for the family <laughs> yeah. in general, I guess. Be but. one for the books, for sure. <laughs> yeah. No um, <laughs> yeah. See, I like that when you said like they don't really, you know, have much contact with us. And because when we've talked about that, some people listen to our show will say like, well, why wouldn't they, why wouldn't they contact us? I'm like, there's humans on this earth who the rest of us have been like, just leave them, <laughs> leave them in the forest. That's their way. And like, just, we're not going to contact them. And it's, you think about it like that. So it's like, if that's just us in the future and these are the, you know, the brightest minds, it would make a lot of sense to me that they would practice these same things that we do now. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, a lot of people make the comparison with uh, tagging a rhino or any sort of animal that we shoot with the dart and, you know, do all these things to it. It probably describes that to its rhino friends the same way that we do when we get abducted, like, you know, we're sedated, we come out of it with this foggy memory, and we know things happen to us, but we're not exactly sure what the bubble <laughs> hurts, and that's about all we can really say. Um, but yeah, I mean, we start to get those memories back, and and they're consistent. Like, there's so much consistency across these reports, and, and I think that's really important to acknowledge. It indicates that it's the same people doing the same types of things throughout a very long period, and, and something that doesn't get mentioned very often either is you have these lifelong contactees like Terry Lovelace, for instance, who see the same individual his entire life, but they don't age. Mm. That's a very good point. And, and there's a number of cases like that. And if they're not aging, it indicates that there's this, and oftentimes it seems like there's an ambassador with Terry Lovelace. It was a woman that he described as sort of a shorter Chinese looking woman. Um, but if you think about it in the context of time travel, like the last interaction they had with him, I'll just use this as an example because I'm already talking about it, but there's others like it. Um, they they come back, they check up on him, you know, 20 years later, but that could be the next day for them. Mm. If they're just visiting a different point in time to sort of follow up and, you know, do more tests or find out whatever it is they're trying to find out, it would help explain why they don't age, but we do if they're just popping in and out 
of different points in our lifetime. So to your to speak on your point about the abductions, that these are relatively rare, but we still have hundreds, if not thousands of cases of people reporting uh, alien abductions. Why is it I would I would assume or at least I've not heard of that many uh, a lot of these abductions don't happen to what you could kind of describe as like high end humans. It's not Olympic athletes. It's not, um, you know, people who would be considered heads in their field, whether it's medical or, you know, theoretical physicists or things like that. Like, why do you think that it's just these uh, most of the time it's just your normal everyday person? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I think probably they don't know or care. I assume they just pop in and try to grab whoever they can. And when I say they're rare, th- there is some indication that it, it happens pretty regularly. And it's probably much more than we understand because a lot of people don't talk about it because of the stigma. I just meant rare in the context of sure. sightings. A lot of people see right. UFOs, but it's a percentage of those who are actually picked up and uh, undergo this this biomedical examination. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. And there is, I mean, there's that old story about Eisenhower being contacted and then we we quit testing the nukes shortly af- thereafter. You know, maybe there is more interaction with uh, high-level humans or, or however you phrased that. But for for just capturing and releasing and doing research on, I assume it's it's usually people in remote areas, for one. They can get in and out. Um, and it, it's probably just whoever's there, whoever's uh, ripe for the picking, the low-hanging fruit, so to speak. That's a good point. Well, it, it, you know, there's so many humans, too, that it's the chance of, you know, if we're going on... Percentage of percentage high-level it, humans, like, yeah. Either, you know, you're you're working yeah, with a larger, a you know, if you're just showing up in the, you know, to just tag the crop field and then you're like, hey, let's grab that guy there, right? It's... Probably well, not going to be a yeah. high profile. No, that's a good down here. Just, might as well just grab them. Yeah, yeah just based on yeah, sampling like and statistical error alone. Like, what are, what's the likelihood that you're going to get yeah. Beyonce, <laughs> you know, out camping it, it in the middle of nowhere? And, you know, she's hanging out. Jay Z and <laughs> well, I don't know. yeah, Jay Z and Patrick <laughs> Mahomes, and they're all just kicking it and I mean, getting uh, getting abducted. So. Yeah, I think there's just, there's a lot of things. I mean, like when you look at the, you know, when you say when we evolve far enough, we start retaining those juvenile aspects, right? Like you, you keep the big head, smaller bodies. So we're, I'm going to butcher the word like, it's neotony or something like that. Neotony. Oh, oh, perfect. oh, perfect. Yeah, he, so, he Googled that. That's the not phonetic. the word, look. No, he no, didn't. No, he's he's, he's trying to prove himself right, right now. No, he did. That's so, good. You know, they, that would make sense to me because if they did see, you know what I mean? You, you're you going down there and you see DK Metcalf, who is like one of the biggest specimens in the NFL right now. To them, that would be archaic. That yeah. would be like, that's not yeah. ideal. This is a caveman, basically. Right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, if they're, if, if they're looking for one of the best athletes, yeah, it seems like he would be a good choice. If they're just looking to get an average of humans in general, then yeah, he's, he's going to be an outlier. They wouldn't want that. So yeah, to your point, I mean, they're probably just looking for convenience, but also a representative sample. If they're going back through different time periods and capturing people and studying them, they would want to have a, a representative sample of them. Um, yeah, I, I, I think with neoteny, it's a, an important thing to consider. And uh, I'll be giving a talk at the Scientific Coalition of UAP Studies here in a couple of weeks. And one of the heads of that organization sent me a couple of papers by a friend of his named Michael D. Swords. He was a professor yeah, that's and nice name. Uh, wrote a couple of papers for MUFON. And it describes the exact same thing I talked about in my book with this neoteny, the pedomorphosis, where you have a retention of these juvenileized traits into adulthood and how that could help explain these physical characteristics of these aliens. He was kind of trashing the time travel model. He was very critical of it, but was describing the exact same things in the same way. Um, so I, I definitely think there's something there. And and, and they're described as, as, you know, children, childlike. Uh, again, Terry Lovelace was talking about these kids out in the field running around uh, in his book. So yeah, I, th- I think uh, it's an important thing to consider in the context of of this model and and how they actually look in these reports. Right now, let's get so that answers a lot of questions I had so far. I want to get to because 
I don't know, so I want to ask. Time travel, as like as far as I know it, and I'm gonna admittedly say I don't know that much, but like traveling. You watch Back to the Future. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> so, it takes a bunch of gigawatts. That's, that's what we need. Terrible, 121 terrible gigawatts. Terrible reference for time yeah. travel. So um, yeah. There's some good ones out there. Back to the Future <laughs> yeah. sucks, um, but there are some pretty decent movies that that really do try to stay true to it. Um, anyway, so no, I'm just saying. Like, so as far as I know, like, if you're saying, if you could approach the speed of light, so like, if I left Earth and I, I traveled at the speed of light and I came back in so many years, I would be relative, like, much younger than the people on Earth. So I kind of traveled to the future, but I, I've never really understood how. Like, what's what's the theory on traveling backwards in time? Yeah, so what you're talking about is special relativity and the twins paradox specifically, uh, which isn't a paradox at all. It's just differences in, in the rate of the passage of time and space when you're in a, a reference frame where you're traveling at a very high rate of speed. Or you can also mimic that by uh, hanging out near a black hole for a while. It right. does the same thing. Uh, but that's that's more general relativity when you're talking about the curvature of space, time and gravitational fields. So with backward time travel, um, for a long time, people thought you had to go faster than the speed of light in order to travel back in, the t in time. But uh, it's not possible, for one. And uh, who knows if that would even happen. But most of the research that has come out since Einstein published his paper on general relativity in 1915 has focused on ways in which you could create what are called closed timelike curves. And that's what really brings you back into the past. It's where time bends back on itself. And in order to do that, something that's consistently demonstrated uh, to create these, to get them, the light cones, to bend back toward the past so that you can move locally forward in time still, but go into the global past. Um, much of the research, really since shortly after he published this paper, has shown that with the rotation of a, a massive or highly energetic sphing, sphing that's not even a word, <laughs> sphere, cylinder, ring. There it is. I think I combined We make up words here all the time. Together. Yep, no it's worries. Or yeah. this. All good. <laughs> it's, it's hard not to do sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, with with each of these, it, it's a consistent theme. And and we see this with you know Van Stockham in the 1930s, the Godel model in the 1950s, both of which were uh, deemed impossible because they required infinite characteristics of the universe or the cylinder. But then you have Frank Tipler in the 1970s who showed that if you have a disk of a finite size spinning fast enough, it can create these closed timelike curves. And that's very similar to what's described with UFOs. You have a rapidly spinning or at least something on the outside like a flywheel is spinning at a high rate of speed on a disk. So there's this, this characteristic of these craft, the, the form of these craft seems to indicate that they have the function of backward time travel just based on what we know about how you might create these closed timelike curves, really since Einstein published that paper in, in 1915. So I, I'm not a physicist. I don't have Empty. Every day, innocent theorists are verbally abused, shot down, or roasted, and are crying out for your help. Please check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash alien theorist podcast with over 100 hours of bonus content. 
For just 16 cents a day, you can help a theorist raise their glass with wine, whiskey, other various inebriants, and love. Join in the next 30 minutes, and you'll be enjoying extra segments and podcasts such as co-conspirators, ATT confidentials, nerds, and many more future segments. Right now, there's a theorist who needs you. Your donation says, you guys are dummies, but you're pretty funny. Please donate right now. I, I'm not a physicist. I don't have the ability to give you calculations or, you know, explain how we exactly. Couldn't, we we couldn't understand them anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'd just be here um, nodding our heads. Yeah, way just, over our heads. Nobody could. But to your description of the, right. uh, you so, know, the, the spinning object as well, that, that sounds re- similar to the concept of what is the Alcubierre drive. Where it's like you have a, you would have a stationary yeah. object, it's probably like a, a, you know, a shaped spherical object within a, like a spinning ring. And that was, it's one of the concepts that basically like yeah. create like a time warp bubble around which that object would allow that object yeah. to move exactly. through space or time, I guess, potentially time as well. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and it helps explain a lot of things about the craft, how they can move in and out of air and water and they don't create uh, vortex is behind them. There's no disturbance to the air. Does, the wind is irrelevant. So it almost does seem like they're creating the space-time bubble around them. And it also helps explain the insane G-forces that they would experience on the inside of these craft. You see them shoot up at tremendous speed, like the Tic Tac dropped 30,000 right. feet in like a couple seconds, I think it was. That would destroy any biological entity on the inside of this thing. But if they're manipulating space time around that craft, it could be a very slow acceleration to them, but we see it as this rapid uh, jump up into the sky, a rapid deceleration. So again, if it's if it's if they're manipulating space time within their reference frame, it might appear different than what we see in this other reference frame as the outside. Well, that would exp- explain some of the rapid motions you see that you know, you hear the zigzagging patterns and horizon to horizon hori- in a second or yeah, that would, that would account for that. Yeah. And just appearing and disappearing too. That's really commonly described in, um, in UFO reports. And one of the only ways you could do that is if they are dipping in and out of the fourth dimension, if something that you're looking at in three dimensions of space suddenly disappears, it indicates it moved in the only other dimension we know of the fourth dimension and went through time. So I think there's a lot of things about the behavior of these craft and the, the the form of them that indicates they have this capability. So what you're saying is the UFO itself is the time machine. They're they're not like. But I think the disc, the discs are. Yeah, I think the triangles probably come from the dark side of the moon or an underwater base. I think those were built in our time, and they use them for different purposes. But I think the the discs are the actual time machine. Yeah. Right. So they actually. I mean, make, make, so no, they're not using like some type of wormhole. They're actually just creating the time warp with their tech. Yeah. That's yeah. I like that's awesome yeah, theory. That's, that's what it seems. It just, just based on again, that history of what we know about how you might create close timeline curves, they, they seem to have that same form, those characteristics. Oh, that's, that's, so really, then that's really if cool. they're coming back and they're, uh, you know, to look at us for uh, perhaps like a historical or an anthropological type of view, would that imply like how, what would that imply in terms of like a, a, you know, a timeline model? Would that be like, you do have a, is it causality right. or is it going to be uh are you going to have the, uh, what is the one that uh, Stephen Hawking also talks about the uh, chronolo- <laughs> chronology prediction conjecture where it's, you know, it's kind of like time, it's like a yeah. huge river and no matter what you do, it's going to come out no matter what um flexing some smart yeah. game muscles here right now <laughs> or you know it's just like time travel has I, it's very it's not very well understood yet so None you know i guess would this imply that no. they're and, trying and to change something or learn something like how would they yeah, apply that, that knowledge might be a part of why they haven't conjecture themselves I mean. <laughs> too. yeah well it, it's a it's a great question there's a couple of things to unpack there um i mostly approached the question of time travel in my book in the context of the block universe. So in that model, they come back through time um, and anything that you did in the past already manifested itself in the future before you even left. 
Because in, in the block universe, everything from the very beginning of the Big Bang to when the very last uh, atom is sucked into a black hole and the universe starts over potentially, all of those moments are already part of this massive four-dimensional block of space-time. So within that, there really is no, there's no paradoxes. There's nothing that you can do to change the past because anything you did in the past is already a part of that future before you even left, regardless of how far back you go. Um, so I mostly approached it that way. It's the most dominant model within the physics community. It's the most conventionally understood way of thinking about the universe and time travel. But then you also have the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics and the multiverse where you have these different dimensions where if you go into the past, it creates a separate timeline. There's this quantum decoherence and then you have these other timelines form where there's an alternate outcome in that future where if you did something, it creates a whole different universe, so to speak. There's this butterfly effect and that really only exists in this model. Um, and, and when people talk about an interdimensional hypothesis, I consider those the same thing. I think what they're talking about is just this multiverse model, but we're still talking about humans, just humans coming from a different timeline as opposed to the same timeline in our future, which is what it would be in the block universe. So, so really it just, it's, it depends on which, um, interpretation of the universe you subscribe to, whether it be the brain universe, B-R-A-N-E, um, the woven expanding or the many worlds interpretation. So these guys are working on Terminator rules. <laughs> Nothing you can do to change the future. You just come back <laughs> and whatever you do in the past causes what happens in the future or no, potentially no fate, but what yeah, you make. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, there are a lot of, I mentioned earlier, um, there are some good uh, pop culture ways of framing this that some people like the the show dark it's a mm, german it's a show mm -hmm. i don't know if yeah. you guys have seen that it's it's dubbed the first two seasons focus on um the block universe everything's self-consistent whatever they do uh, affects the the future the past everything's self-consistent throughout the uh, Novikov self-consistency principle but then the third uh season they went into the multiverse and everything gets really wacky and confusing and the show kind of went to shit at that point, in my opinion. But um, there's there's other ones, too. There's other um, movies and TV shows that do a decent job. There's also ones that do a completely <laughs> crap job. Um, I, go, I like 12, 12 Monkeys is a I good block it. universe time travel movie. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Absolutely. I just watched that again uh, a couple months Phenomenal. ago. It's a great movie. It's been a while. I think um, I don't know if you've ever read the, uh, the Hyperion Cantos by Dan Simmons. Have you ever read those? Probably not. No, uh, yeah, they they pause the it kind of the same Simmons. thing uh, in the that type of model of the universe where it's pretty much uh, time travel happens at the behest of like an advanced AI. Like we've gotten to a point where it's like AI goes back to ensure its creation, kind of like Terminator rules, but it's kind of um, mm. yeah, kinda, yeah. But uh, you know, you, there's cool. you know a I'm whole sure. bunch of like moving back and forth. It talks about you know humanity's uh, evolution. Eventually, like you move so far to a point where you have humans that live in different environments, and we've learned to adapt to such a point. You have humans that are yeah evolved to live in you know the dark, the deepest parts of space, where you have li you know limb elongation, <laughs> um, you know become almost evolved like wings of some type, propulsion or something like that. But um, yeah. that's a that's a one that's I kind of that came to my head when I read about uh, the the way that you phrase the time travel or how you posit tra time travel would work within your theory. So yeah, there's there's another one too. Um, who was the guy that was in Galactica? Galactica. Oh, Ethan yeah, Hawke. Ethan Hawke. Yeah, yeah, that's a good movie too. Ethan Hawke. Yeah, he did a movie that starts with yeah. An Are you talking about the one based um, on um, what's his face? Uh, guy wrote starship troopers I, don't know, I can't remember his name right now um maybe i don't know i somebody like told me over and over like you got to watch this you got to watch this and I, and I did and it was really good but they did an awesome job you can tell they had some consult oh, robert heinlein yeah i think um, i think you're uh robert heinlein the uh, the science fiction author does a couple time travel ones which i think kind of fit on yours as well um kind of what yeah. you do uh I guess I'm sitting in front of a computer. I think, was it Predestination? Really is that the one with Ethan Hawke? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was it. Yeah. That was it. Predestination. Yeah, the closed the that. closed loop. Yeah, yeah, that's they do a good job in that one too. Now yeah. 
back on this subject of uh, aliens coming back to picking this up, do you think that, because when I'm thinking that you see these people with multiple, you know, abduction and reoccurring incidents with the same people, what, why would you, would you go back just because to see how that person ages and Follow genetic changes? Like, is that, is that all it is? Cause like for me, I'm like, if you're looking for DNA and stuff like that, like if, if it's us from the future, I mean, we should age similar. Like there would be some similarities that I would imagine you could just extrapolate from the one visit. Like why the need to go and reoccur, like keep visiting the same subject. You think it would be more co- like yeah. worthwhile to go get a variety, Spread it out. get a variety. Well, I mean, it, it comes down to it. And I, I'll, I don't yeah. know. I'm going to go ahead and <laughs> throw that out there. I, I don't know. This is just b- based on, uh, general aspects of research, I, I would answer that by saying, in, in many cases, you have cross-sectional samples. You have, uh, for instance, m- most of my non-UFO research, I study the eyes and how our uh, vision diminishes throughout our lifetimes. But there's also differences among different populations with regard to vision. So East Asians, for instance, upwards of 80 to 90 percent of them have juvenile onset myopia. They start losing their vision around age nine, 10 years old. Um, So a lot of my research focused on these different groups and how their cranial facial anatomy, their ocular anatomy varies among these different people. But we also look longitudinally. We want to see how one individual changes throughout their life. So how the eye and the brain interact uh, anatomically and how that relates to their vision throughout their lifetime. So if they're doing longitudinal studies on these people, it might help explain why they keep getting picked up, why they put tracking devices in them. Many report having this, you know, little thing that looks exactly like a tracking device. So if they're doing a longitudinal study, maybe they did something to that person. Maybe they're just of interest for some reason and they want to see what happens throughout their lifetime, biologically, uh, neurologically, who knows what it is they're studying. But like I mentioned earlier, you know, you could pick this person up that you could do an entire study throughout an individual's lifetime over the course of yeah. a couple of days, mm. all in the same day. If you were ambitious enough and had a lot of coffee, <laughs> cocaine, I guess. space but cocaine, if the you best come kind. back and you pick <laughs> space, space future cocaine, space. Cocaine. Yeah. I, I assume they have some good <laughs> stuff in the future. Um, so yeah, you pick this person up when they're 15, when they're 25, when they're 50, when they're 70, And you can do all of that over the course of a couple of days and you would see the same person. They're not aging, you're aging. Um, But yeah, I I would assume it's just some aspect of uh, a a longitudinal study, something about that growth and development process that's of interest to them. Now, as far as like theories about like ETs, obviously there's the, we're we're talking about from the future, but there's also like, like, you know, other, other species on planets have just evolved and they've, take an interest in our planet for whatever reason, like either it would be a nuclear war or what, whatever it may be. What, what, uh, what do you think about that? Is there just room for room for both or what is, what's your theory on that? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I don't consider this model to be mutually exclusive with the extraterrestrial hypothesis or ultra terrestrials or even the simulation hypothesis. I think all of them, uh, should be weighed in accordance with what little evidence exists within this field. Um, but yeah, I think I think there's a very good possibility that there's other life forms on other planets. Um, the fact that it happened here so quickly after it could, about 3.7 billion years ago, once we had water, once we had an atmosphere, we see life, boom, there it is. So the fact that it happened here that quickly means it probably did in other places too. The the issue for me is just how unlikely it is that we would get an an upright walking human form evolve on these planets over the course of however many billions of years they needed to form and that they would be close enough that we would find each other, that they would exist at the same time because the universe is roughly 15 billion years old. What's the likelihood that we would get humanoids close enough that are here at the same time and just slightly more technologically advanced than right. us. 
it's it's a really low probability. It makes more sense that it's just humans that are more technologically advanced because they're in our future. They've had more time to develop these technologies. It's just in, in the context of the simplest solution, Occam's razor principle of parsimony, it just it seems more logical that humans with more advanced technology are us in the future as opposed to a, a humanoid form that happened to develop on another planet. And, and we can do it with them. Apparently, like Antonio yeah, VS yeah. Boas, <laughs> my favorite one of the sex oil. We've it. talked about him lots of times. They had a vagina. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, and and she's probably just doing a nasty. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I think you just uh, coined a new shirt. Coined, for us. Yeah, coined a shirt right there. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> but no, like, like they're obviously similar enough that they we can have sex with them. You know, something on another planet. It's far shot. Yeah. That, that's a pretty specific thing. And if we if there are hybrids, just based on the biological classification of species concept, it means they would have to be the same species if we're able to reproduce and produce viable offspring. So I think those things should be Well, that makes sense too. to me because you think about it, like you were talking, you know, we evolved obviously to walk bipedal. There were side effects that came along with that, right? Like potentially short ing- gestation oh, yeah. period, herniated discs, that type of stuff. So let's say we evolve all the way to being a short graze. Like, what, is there a fucking gestation period three days? How the hell would you fit that thing? Like you got a tiny body with, and you're producing this baby with a giant head out of there. It makes sense that you might have yeah. to go back in time to keep your population alive because you can't reproduce anymore. Ooh, like that. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I, I, uh, the the big head small hole problem as we <laughs> call it in anthropology, um, but yeah, I, I just I actually wrote probably ten to fifteen pages in my new book about oh, wow. that very thing because in in many of these cases, yeah, we, we're already at the point where the big head small hole problem is it's a, pr- it's a problem. I see energy. it regularly as a paramedic. It's terrifying problem. when you're trying to deliver a baby in the back yeah. of an alley. And <laughs> it's a little hard. Yeah. yeah. So, so we've gotten around that problem with C-sections, at least in developed countries. Upwards of 30% of women die in childbirth in, in less developed countries because of the same biological issue. In places where C-section technology is available, it may help us get around that. We just cut the baby out. But if you, if you look at the reports of, of people that have been in these large triangular craft, and, and a couple of them, Jerry Wills is one example. Terry Lovelace, again, is another example. There's They both report seeing the same thing where you have these walls of incubating fetuses with human characteristics. So it almost seems like we, we move beyond C-section and go into external gestation where we have external uteruses and we grow our babies in that capacity. If that's the case, yeah, that could help explain the diminutive genitalia, sort of the asexual characteristics of these more distant future humans, the greys, where we just don't reproduce that way anymore. I'm, I'm hoping we don't give up sex. <laughs> well, I, I don't it's not worth living anymore. It's something we well, should ever you do. You know, there's enough. Maybe it's... Yeah, that, that's not a future. Maybe it's something where it's like, the, you know, because we do have, as you coined, uh, some some coming back doing the nasty and the pasty. Um, <laughs> but That's not me. That's <laughs> no, not me. <laughs> no, no. I was just quoting. No. Um, there's uh, maybe it's one of those things where they, we still have sex, but maybe we remove the, um, you know, the fertilized egg early on and then do the rest of the yeah. gestation period in an artificial in womb. Lab, yeah. Um, yeah. And that seems to be what they're doing is they're taking these these gestating fetuses from from young girls, young women, um, and then, yeah, finishing that that development elsewhere and it's it's not likely that they're doing it in you know another surrogate a human they're most likely doing it in uh in these external gestation tubes Uh, it really is the the test tube baby i mean if you look at it too like as far as evolving goes like to me that would be the safest way to have a child there's zero complications with it right and not to mention you don't have to carry it you know what i mean you don't go through any of those risks there's no risks of you know, spontaneous abortion, anything like that. And then the birthing process, there's no trauma, nothing. Like, right. That's fucking cool. Yeah. Another thing I, I mentioned in this this new book too is the social impact. It One of the biggest reasons why we struggle with gender equality throughout the world is because the woman has that burden of carrying the baby and, and feeding the baby. They're the primary caregiver in every animal society. So 
it could it really help with uh, gender equality in the future too if that gets outsourced to an incubation chamber and neither man nor woman has to really right. carry that burden. Cool. That's cool. I like that. I like right. that theory. Blew my mind. Now, uh, so we're, we're about 45 minutes right now. Uh, do we have more, some more questions? Uh, no, I, all my questions got answered and then some, I gotta be honest though. I was like, I'm really enjoying this interview. It's going great. Dr. Mike, you're awesome. But when you said that you needed to go put on a hat and you came back on without an Indiana Jones hat, I was pretty disappointed. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> oh, my God. The first archaeological dig I ever did, there was this huge douchebag that showed up <laughs> with the Indiana Jones hat. And I shit you negative. He, oh, no. <laughs> he was carrying a whip on his belt. And he was the biggest tool I have ever met in my entire life. And at that point, I was yeah. like, nope. I'm not going to be that guy. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Even though I've wanted to a few times, I just, I can't bring myself to do it. Well, right on. Uh, so the, your, your last book was Identified Flying Saucers. You said you, you have a, you said you have a new book coming out. What was that one called? Yeah, that's just called the Extra Tempestrial Model. Um, and it, so the first book, uh, mostly kind of spelled out the science of, of why this seems to be future humans, uh, largely based on our morphological evolution, but also these aspects of time travel that we've talked about. Um, looking at the Drake equation, Fermi paradox, like all of the uh, astronomy, astrobiology stuff too. But there was only some mention of actual abduction cases or any type of close encounter this book kind of flips that on its head and it um kind of sets up the model for those that didn't read the first book but then focuses on 15 specific case studies and looks at them in the context of this extra tempestrial model the extraterrestrial hypothesis simulation hypothesis ultra terrestrials and all of these other models to um help explain the phenomenon just to kind of see how they fit to like break them down and then see whether or not they conform to this time travel model, if there's a better explanation for some of these things. So, um, yeah, it's still, you know, uh, the same, the same long, strange trip. It's just uh, a different way of framing it, looking at uh, people's experiences and, and pre some pretty well known, and then also some lesser known cases. All right. And now just one final, one final question. What do you think the best evidence we have? in modern times to support uh, your theory? Like, is it one of the, one of the videos that's been declassified or a program that's been declassified or what, what would you point people to who don't really know where to go? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, as far as like something tangible that's been validated, uh, the Tic Tac mm -hmm. videos is one of the few things we have because the Department of Defense here in the U.S. acknowledged the reality of these and has been sort of shifting us toward disclosure more broadly. But that aspect of the, these accelerations and decelerations, I think it's the best way of explaining those G-forces and how it's whoever's piloting these things. If there is a pilot, there could be AI involved as well. But if there is a, a human, humanoid, some sort of biological entity piloting these things, their manipulation of space time in and around this craft, I think is um, a good indication. But my favorite abduction account is that of uh, Amy Rylance in Australia. And I'll be talking about that one a little bit more along with some others in my workshop at Contact in the Desert. Uh, the lecture that I'm giving kind of spells out the, the theory as a whole and then in the workshop, we kind of, it's, it's more based on this new book where we dive into some of these case studies and sort of pick them apart and see uh, how they fit. But I, I feel like that one, is, it just screams time travel. This, the first time I read about that, I was like, what the fuck? Like, this, <laughs> awesome. is, this is it. Like, this, that's exactly what happened to her. It's the only way I think that that experience, the way she describes it and what the cops reported and what the hospital staff reported, I think it's one of the only ways it can be explained really. It's amazing. All right. Now, if besides contact in the desert, June 25th, the 28th, uh, where can people find your work? You have a website, socials. Yeah. Um, got a website. It, 
it was an abbreviated version of the book title. I'd fly obj.com. I think the URL still works, but I uh, got a new URL. It's just my name, michaelpmasters.com, because it's easier than I'd fly <laughs> obj, which isn't yeah. even a word. <laughs> People were like, well, can you spell that? I'm like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. So I finally did. Yeah. Um, so michaelpmasters.com. I got the the Twitter the Instagram where I watch people's drunk <laughs> dance parties. Oh, um, shit. <laughs> got the uh, the Facebook. So yeah, all of the requisite uh, social media accounts. So yeah, and I try to I try to respond to everybody. It's not always possible, awesome. but I do my best. Right on. All right, thanks, Mike. We're uh, we're gonna do a quick little summary here without you, but we'll hopefully talk to you again soon. Right on, man. All right. You, you too. Care. You guys take care. Have take care. One. Bye. Have a good Bye. night. Beauty. That guy's a beauty. That guy's a beauty. Dude. All right. Can, the difference in tone, that interview that we watched, yeah. not, he was not having fun in that first interview at all. No, the, the yeah, interview. But he we, also probably wasn't hung over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no. No, he, no. I mean, like the interview that we watched, Dan, he looked fucking miserable. And I was like, oh, this guy's not. Oh, maybe he was mad. more hung over. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. oh, no maybe. he was a beauty. That was no, a that fun. guy's awesome. Yeah, he's good. He's a nice guy. Yeah, uh, that guy's wicked. I think most, you know, and I think most like he's a he's a professor. He's like a college professor. And I think most college professors are pretty much like him within his age range. Like they're all kind of like that. <laughs> they're yeah. all pretty cool. Yeah, he was awesome. Yeah, that was that was fun. That's uh, I love. That's a great great theory, and he presented it really well. I fucking loved it. That was cool. it was great. I, to me, I'm buying in. That's my new theory. There you go. I, I like it. it. It makes a it, it answers a lot of questions. That's my new theory of, of why ETs are always humanoid looking and bipedal and yeah, or like or not you know, always, but mostly the rapid movement, the visiting numerous people. Uh, does it pop, do you get more questions from it? Yes, there's sure there's some more tons questions. of questions, but tons of questions, but we don't know because <laughs> uh, it's about time travel. It's about time travel. Yeah. <laughs> time travel. You go is, for is endless it, loop. Yeah, it's a uh, no. That was a. Good interview. I really liked. I really liked hearing that guy. Yeah, speak. I'd have him on again. I really want to do. We got to look up the case file that he or uh, the one in Australia. The one said? in Australia. We. I want to. I want to. What was her name? I can't remember. We'll have to, we'll have to watch, listen back. We'll listen back at the name because I'd like to do a case file on that now. Is he like he was like what the fuck? And those are it ones might be I on the list. It might be on there because I remember reading about one of the abduction cases, going through the abduction cases and being like one. Or two in Australia. It might be on the list. I always like asking. Yeah, we'll go back and listen for sure. Asking someone like him, like, what's your, like, if you were to say it to someone who didn't know anything about UFOs or aliens, and you'd be like, check this case out. Yeah. That's the one. And yeah. he's like, this one and the Tic Tac. There you go. Yeah. And I was like, cool, man. Cool. He's like, I looked in this one. What the fuck? I was like, okay, well, now I now need I, to look yeah, it If up. you're saying what the fuck, then we'll be saying the same yeah. thing. Uh, that was fun. That was good. I'm glad we that energy drink really helped. I had the half a energy drink. Yeah, we Dan, we went and shared. We bought a, one of those. Bangs. We banged. Yeah, there we banged go. hard. We banged. <laughs> we banged hard. We banged hard. Banged together. Yeah, yeah. we banged. I, together. We did. I drank a yeah. full pot of coffee and I don't know six seven ounces of whiskey to get back to normal. <laughs> we each took a turn banging. <laughs> yeah, it was good. <laughs> we split yeah. it right, right down half, the middle. Half yeah. bang. Yeah, yeah, half bang. Half bang. Half bang. Nice. I don't think I could handle a full bang. Yeah. <laughs> A little too hungover for that. That's what that way both of us got to finish. We yeah. each finished our our half bang. <laughs> half yeah. bang. Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff. When he was talking about that Ethan Hawk movie, fucking the, the Robert Heinlein. Uh Heinlein has a bunch of time travel stuff that is uh pretty much like that. Also, Heinlein stuff gets really weird in his later years, and it's all about like going back and banging your mom. It's it's real uh, Futurama Oedipus stuff. Rex. Like Rex. <laughs> I mean, that's, I mean, all of fucking Heinlein later is like doing the nasty and the pasty, like he's nasty in drama, <laughs> like Fry going back and banging his mom. Like, yeah, yeah that's what that's from. Like okay, all yeah. it is. I remember it now. <laughs> Fuck, I love that nasty and the pasty. Um, it rolls off the tongue. No, our chat, it's, it's hard to read the chat and stay involved in an interview. So I, I do not lie that I was neglecting the chat for most of the interview. And I'm the one that's supposed to uh, check the chat because it's hidden on Ryan's screen. So that's my bad. Sorry, everyone, if you had questions. Um, like we were said, enthralled in it, man. Yeah, it's, it's hard to it's hard to focus on chat. And then you could ask him questions for days. There's like big yeah, words yeah. being used and stuff. Like it was fucking hard to pay attention. Yeah, no, that was fun. I enjoyed. It. I, I love the theory. It's nice to hear like an explanation of theories you hear all the time. Like they're asked from the future. Yeah. Like, okay, well, what does that mean? That's like, my theory. Well, it means this is what I think it means, and and goes into detail. It's yeah, it's sweet. like, oh, yeah. okay, well, I we've said that high and drunk. Yeah. Maybe it's just us <laughs> coming back. I think that's I a mean, pretty universal like his, thing. His, his theory, like right off the bat, brings to mind like 
at least five different science fiction novels that have been published like in the past like since the 50s oh i'm not okay so <laughs> i'm not course. i'm not saying that like he's he's come up with this but it's like that he's now like extrapolating it explaining it making better connections other than my drunk mind who just went it's us coming back i was like oh okay yeah the you know i kind of forgot that we evolve you yeah. kind of like as you're you now you just kind of forget that this isn't how we've always looked and this probably isn't going to be how we always look in the future so it's like yeah. uh i you know kind of miss just forget about those kind of things so when he says that i'm like oh i didn't even think about that that's why you have a phd <laughs> yeah that's fun how sweet is that is that this guy's job is just he's thinking he's basically doing our job professionally i was gonna with research with well, I mean, research he's a, he's a doctor, man. Like, yeah. he's an associate doctor. professor well, like, well that's what teaches. i'm saying he's well, hey we got a dan that should work he's theorizing he's here. theorizing but he's using you know he's supporting he's, he's, supporting it. he's, backing he's it using up. big words yeah. i mean that's what yeah that's what academia is yeah <laughs> we do the same thing with you no think about research stuff and then you write really long pages how you say that academia yeah. Mm, academia. Academia. Mm -hmm, right. Is that a is that a cookie? Is that a nut? It's an academia nut. Yeah. yeah, I, love yeah. Academia. I fucking love those cookies. Yeah, it's good. good. Yeah. Whole house. The chocolate academias. Buy a bunch when you go to Hawaii. You always buy shit. Yeah. <laughs> Do you um, no, funk? that was good, man. I was very surprised. I had fun. Do you wanna funk? Honestly, there was it was when we watched that first interview with him just to learn about some oh. of the stuff he's talking about. We all like looked at each other and we're like, holy, this yeah. guy is. I just, yeah, I just really wanted to ask him, well, because, but we got to it. I was like, we asked him, I was like, I was like, so what kind of, you know, what movie time travel rules are they yeah. operating on? Yeah. Here? It's like, well, so that's Terminator. the best way to explain Terminator, it. even though it's the worst time travel model, is the best time travel model. Well, no, also, also 12, like, honestly, 12 Monkeys is, I think, the best time travel movie. Is it, do they spoon feed it? But to that's you? also, that's also, oh, that's what I need. Rules. That's I need like them just changing to, the past changes the future. Um, it's no, no, it doesn't. What you no, make. it doesn't. Dan. That's the fucking Terminator. Dan, model. No, you got to rewatch 12 start, monkeys. We can't start this 12 right now. monkeys. Isn't change the past, change the future. When they go back, oh, they, you caught. All right. You go back and you go back. He's, in time it's already happened. The Nothing. They can't change anything well, because it's, they've, oh. it's exactly the block. Right. That's the, that's the whole one I was saying about the, like the chronology preservation, kind of yeah. like preservation conjectures that time travel, it doesn't matter because no matter what you go back, the universe always wants to go in a certain direction and you can't stop it. Whatever you do back in the past just causes well, the future. Well, no, this, this lines up more with what he said, where he said, when you go back in the like all this is from the big bang to the end of time is is happened it's predetermined it's happened already that's how 12 monkeys operates even though you're experiencing it from the character's point of view who's trying to change things how you you will realize in that movie that all this has been done it doesn't matter that like there is no he can't change anything like he's going back yeah. with the thinking he can change but him going back like it doesn't it it leads to the exact same future that right. he lives in right yeah it's terminator rules yeah terminator rules. but yeah you go back to go back to try to stop watch skynet but watch. you actually end up creating skynet i'm sure we if we get too we can't get any deeper in this will be another two hours yeah in here. um no that was excellent excellent way to finish finish uh a lazy sunday because lazy hungover no that was sore dude, i was really worried about that and that was a lot of fun yeah, yeah. brought us back all right, let's uh, let's wrap this one up. Coming back with case file one ninety tomorrow. Can you believe it? One hundred ninety case files. One hundred and ninety, almost big old two hundred. That's crazy. We're, we're well, what are we doing for two hundred? We're over two. Well, we're over two hundred episodes, but case file two hundred will have to be some type of cop out clip show or something. I'm yeah, sure. yeah, case yeah. file two hundred. Let's file. just <laughs> just just let's just use case file one hundred and also put it for two hundred. Just oh yeah, use all the same <laughs> clips. Same clips. Okay. Um, Mm. no that would be a good it'd be a fun recap because you know what we put too much pressure on these big anniversary shows like let's just do a show of the last 100 from 100 to now some of the or maybe like some just of the highlights open up the line to like yeah. call in tell us your favorite moment of the show or something, yeah. know, something. we'll Make figure it, it out game. speaking of that may 30th S -S cosmic channels is back S -S 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 -S. well i was like gonna say something else and then i couldn't remember uh it'll be long it'll be out that hopefully will be out before this releases Oh, yes. But <laughs> no. well, those listening live, you know. Hopefully, yeah. yeah, tell your friends <laughs> the 30th. We're coming back. Long hiatus is over. Peace. Bye-bye.
up to date with all things alien theorist theorizing, follow us across social media on Twitter, Instagram, Patreon, and Facebook. For updates on new videos and content on YouTube, don't forget to click like and subscribe and hit that notifications button to keep those eyes on the skies with alien theorists theorizing.